go. Welcome, Tom Ahorn. Ahern, sorry. <laughs> no, mate, either is fine. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and how are you? Good. I'm really good. Yeah. Um, given the times, you know, working from home, we're, we're, uh, we're quarantined whether we like it or not, mate. So I'm happy. Yeah, fantastic, dude. Um, it's so great to see you. And it's, it's, thank you very much for coming on the show as well. Love it, mate. I love talking with you. We always, from the, from the moment we started working together to where our friendship has blossomed now, it's always been a deep and meaningful chat. I've always come away um, a little bit more knowledgeable and open-minded. So it's great, man. Well, it's been very much a reciprocal uh, relationship in that sense. And I know the, the moment I, I met you, I knew you were a deeper thinker. So I was like, I'm going to hold on to this. I'm going <laughs> to <Yeah>. hold on. <laughs> not going to let you me- go. <laughs> I'll, I'll never let you go. I'll never, right. Just like in the Titanic. Yes. <laughs> uh, Tommy, I, I got you on the show because we've both taken natural progression since we first met. And, uh, you know, I've moved very much into helping to, uh, you know, kind of hold the space for men who are wanting to find that balance in their lives um, since they've become fathers. And you've really progressed in uh, leap and bounds into um, really like exploring um, the the mind space. And you've come from a really interesting background. I'd love for you to uh, tell the peeps uh, at home exactly what that background has been. Yeah, sure. Well, I suppose I wasn't... um you know, it wasn't like a fairy tale background. I wasn't always interested in the mind, you know, I was really interested in, um, in wanting to become an AFL player, you know? Um, and then, uh, when I was about 21 and hey, what team were you going to play for? Oh, well, I was going to play for Hawthorne and, you know, I was going to kick the winning goal on grand final day and, (laughs) you know, of course, just the way it would happen. No, but my, um, my, I guess, transition into, um, my love of psychology happened inadvertently. Um, I, when I was around 2021, um, a lot of things changed in my life and my mental health started to decline. So, um, I guess the, the long story short is that, um, my research and the philosophy that I take into my counseling work, uh, grew from, uh, what I call me search, trying to figure myself out, understand myself, understand what was going on with my mind and why I was getting all of these incredibly intrusive, uh, painful, uh, thoughts and why it was, um, making me think that, um, I didn't want to be here anymore. You know, things that it was just a, a very long, arduous, um, existential crisis that, yeah, probably went on for about four or five years. And, um, that whole process was just, um, a lot of over analysis, a lot of reflection, a lot of writing, a lot of reading, and um, a lot of uh, talking to people, to try to figure it out. And, um, you know, as is always the case, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, and I couldn't imagine my life without the crisis or, or the breakthrough. <laughs> mm-hmm. Amazing. And, and it's led you to where you are now, which is uh, such a more well equipped equipped person when it comes to uh, looking within and dealing introspectively with challenges that might come up. Uh, I'd love for you to just kind of briefly touch on how perhaps how you navigated certain challenges internally and how you've come to where you are at today. Yeah, sure. Well, I think, um, I suppose like when you look at existential crises from a practical standpoint, what essentially happens is that, um, who one is, is no longer, um, serving that individual. So for whatever reason, and more often than not, what happens is, uh, either something traumatic, um, uh, or a a goal that was very meaningful to us and, and really, uh, you know, represented who we were to a degree, um, becomes not as meaningful or it's taken away. So, for, for whatever reason, the carpet of identity is pulled from beneath our feet and we're left to kind of gather and pick the pieces up. Um, and depending on the degree of trauma um, or, the, or, 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 the, or the uncontrollable event um, leads to a serious disembodiment of identity and who we are becomes um, this, this very 
uh, transient, you know, um, thing. And it's, it's very difficult for us to, to make sense of all that. So I think when you're talking about how to navigate an existential crisis, what we want to do is, and I did this the wrong way because I didn't know, I went right into reflection and inner engineering and, um, I went crazy for a long time. In fact, what, you know, for a couple of months when I was living in Bali, I, I, um, I went through a state of psychosis when I was hearing voices and seeing things and um, it wasn't fun. <laughs> um, but um, what you want to do when you're moving through an existential crisis or, you know, when you're trying to navigate change in your life is you want to have one foot grounded in what you can control and what does make you feel like you do have a self and a sense of identity. And for a lot of people that's, um, you know, crutch in the form of uh, family and friends and people you love. Um, and then you also want to have another foot that's grounded in self-exploration. A really easy way to do that is just to journal. So have a, have a think about, you know, um, who you are, you know, why thoughts are coming up, you know, and very quickly as you freely associate on the page, um, patterns and, and things will, will begin to, to come up and you can, you can follow that, you know, but you don't want to spend too much time in either side. And I often find that when I'm helping people move through these kind of situations is that they have both feet in either one side of everything is I need to control everything and therefore I'm not open to change at all, or it's everything is just change and chaos. And I don't know who I am because there's nothing that's grounding me and keeping me, uh, um, in, in some kind of schema. Uh, look, th this is um, unbelievably poignant uh, for so many reasons, but the, yeah. the, the most, uh, the most um, clear reason I, I, I think I've had you on uh, in this group is because so many dads and fathers in this group are dealing with such a reality shift and such a paradigm shift when it comes to uh, being a bachelor or being uh, in a relationship, but dealing with themselves being the center of their own universe and then pop out this kid and all of a sudden you are not, you learn very quickly that you are not the center of your own universe. And, and, and I think uh, your experience of what you've, you've just been talking about can be a really, really interesting, um, you know, an interesting tale that, that many dads listening to this could, could relate to. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, I, I can't, I, I can't speak from experience um, with regard to fatherhood, but I can't imagine uh, anything quite as significant, you know, um, akin to like the death of a loved one than, than, you know, and in a good way than moving through uh, becoming a parent because no longer are you not the center of your own universe. You're no longer the center of the one you love's universe as well. So there's this very different change of like, okay, how do I navigate this? Um, which, and I think it's so important, especially when you're in counseling, um, helping other people, mental health, mental health is something that, um, you know, moves through every industry. I personally believe so important to validate people's experience in that regard, mm -hmm. just recognizing that fatherhood, you know, isn't easy on the others, on the plus side of that, it's going to be one of the most meaningful things if you show up, um, which is brilliant. Um, but no one ever said it was easy. And sometimes we need to just take a set, a step back and go, Whoa, this is really tough. Without a doubt. And I think you, you, you also hit the nail on the head, like no, nothing, kind of nothing meaningful is easy, you know, like being able to step through that discomfort and to be able to step into that new reality and the paradigm as a father that, you know, in this group, we've all shared experiences of challenges that we've had to deal with, whether it's physical, um, emotional, mental, relationship-wise. And th the reality is, is everything is affected when uh, you when you bring a new living being that's a part of you into your everyday life. Your relationship, as you said, your relationship with your loved one, uh, your partner changes, your relationship with yourself changes, and the dynamic between all three or more of you change as well. So I think it's such a meaningful um, journey to go on that you're talking about and things like journaling has been such a pivotal and powerful process for me to go through when i implement it in my morning ritual it's just like 
it's such a powerful process. Yeah, exactly. You have to give, I often say that you, you have to um, give the, the, the chaos um, uh, boundaries. So when you, if you just sit, sometimes, you know, it's really hard just to sit with our thoughts. It sounds simple, but thoughts can lead us to dark places, places that we've not been before, places that we've either consciously or subconsciously tried to avoid. But what journaling mm -hmm. does is actually it gives you the power to decide which thought to explore. And that's such an important factor that goes back to what I was saying before about having a foot uh, in the orderly and then a foot in the uh, self-exploratory. Because when you are journaling, it's like, okay, I probably don't feel uh, like today's a good day to explore that area of the mind. And that's fine. You know, a couple of weeks after, maybe sure. But today I'm just going to explore this area. The pen gives you the power. The pen is mightier than the sword. It's a very trite thing to say, but it is true. <laughs> very true and i think we want to feel you know life is a is a big paradox and we always work in opposites and we want to feel when we're moving through change that there are things we can control you know um from a practical standpoint we want to be able to always be able to go back to a happy place you know or home is where the heart is and things like that and journaling is a way to um add some discipline to the self-exploratory Mm. I, I also find that having the act, like you mentioned, uh, the pen is mightier than the sword, having the act of being able to write something down almost gives you that, I don't know if disconnection is the, the, the right word, but it's space in between yourself and your, a, a, and your thoughts. And if need be, and I know I always have the option to rip the paper out of my journal and burn it if I need to but the act of actually writing something out can be a really cathartic experience for me. Um, yeah. are, there, are there any other tools that you uh, could recommend or explore when it comes to, you know, dealing with this change in uh, paradigm that so many fathers do deal with? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, just before as well, the, the leading researcher um, in the 80s, and it was uh, a bloke named James Pennebaker, and he really kind of brought the, the, the clinical research um of journaling to to the psychological world to the psychological literature and he always thought that because writing is slower it actually gives us time to integrate the thought but uh just writing on a computer is is just as effective so um it's interesting anyway um you know right. this is this is another one um there are so many ways to gain awareness um you know to pull ourselves out of the jar so that we can have a look at the label and you know we talk about psychedelics in this day and age. We talk about um, journaling. We talk about meditation and all this sort of stuff. But the thing that's actually helped me the most is open, honest communication. And I found that to be really powerful within my own relationship. And I want to be clear when I say open, honest communication, that isn't lovey dovey. That is open, honest communication because honesty is some of the hardest stuff to talk about. I'm struggling I feel like we're not having enough sex. I feel like I'm no longer the center of your world. I feel like I don't or am not capable to be a dad. Like that's hard shit. But by listening to the other person, and this is obviously why we have free speech so that we can say whatever we, whatever the emotion is telling us to say in the hope that through an open, honest, meaningful conversation, we'll be able to order it and 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 get it right but you have to be able to i suppose you have to be willing enough to be courageous enough to just say whatever you feel and know that your partner is going to recognize where that's coming from i'm not having a go at you i'm not attacking me personally but i'm just saying that i'm scared right now or that i'm really happy or that i'm really lost or that i'm resentful you know i mean a relationship is where two people come together to grow together you know they, they are complete within themselves, but it's better to better ride when they're together. And yeah. I think a major portion of that is in, uh, conflict resolution and moving through changes, um, as, as a, as a relationship. Yeah. Beautiful. Like really well said. And, uh, I think, uh, so many of us, uh, would identify with the vulnerabilities that you, uh, expressed at the beginning of that little portion. Um, is there any, uh, advice you could offer, to us dads about to, to those of us who have a um suppose an underlying fear of what 
their partner might, uh, how their partner might react if they were going to go ahead and be completely open, honest, fluid, and, uh, you know, uncensored. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I think practicing is really, really good. You know, I think because telling the truth is so hard, I, I'm, I'm a very, um, I, I really use practicality in my counseling world um, because it makes so much sense tangibly, you know? And um, I think telling the truth is really hard. It's a skill like anything else, like writing a book, like playing the guitar. And there is a difference between telling the truth, you know, that comes from the Simpsons and telling the truth. <laughs> but um, what you want to do, I think is, is practice it, you know, because sometimes we don't actually really know what the truth is, you know? I suppose that's where the difference between truth and honesty is. I'm being honest telling you that this is what I feel. It's not the truth. It's just how I feel. And I'm being honest about that. So again, we come back to journaling, writing it down gives us the words to express the uh, perhaps, you know, unexpressible, um, inexpressible. I'm not sure, but um, that really helps both work. Yeah. I think also, um, you will be able to find someone that you feel like you can be honest with. And mm. sometimes we just want a backboard to bounce off. And I think talking to a friend can be really good. Have you, ever, have you ever felt this before? You know, this is why I think the work that you do is so incredible because it gives dads the chance to be able to backboard um, off, uh, off things that they're probably all going through. You know, yes, mm. I'm feeling that too. Okay. Well, how did you resolve that conflict? What did you say? You know, mm. we need to be able to practice so that when we take it into, because it's not necessarily that we don't trust our partners, um, you know, that's a, that's another matter. What we want to do is say the right thing and mm. you have to practice that. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's interesting you say that. So the, the, one of the reasons I started this, uh, this group, the art of healthy dads is because it's, and, and the hero program itself is because it's a common ground for people in the same situation, uh, aiming to get towards a common goal. So yes. we're in a way speaking the same language. And uh, what I've felt is when people bring up challenges in this community, uh, it's almost like we, we, we speak the same language when it comes to crystallizing uh, a message that they may want to bring back to their loved ones. And yep. I think that's, that, that's what's been a real key here. It's being able to, to crystallize that message into a language that, that you can then communicate to someone who isn't necessarily on the exact same journey as you are, but you, you ultimately want to get to the common, the common goal, which is, you know, happiness within your relationship and within the, the, the family household. Yeah. And it's so important to actually define what the goal is because sometimes we'll say something, um, and we'll, you know, to what end we don't have enough sex. It's like, okay, well, how much sex is enough? Well, I don't yeah. know. Okay. <laughs> so understanding what a healthy, happy, meaningful relationship looks like for you specifically is so important because that's going to add um, so much more. What's the word I'm looking for here? It, it'll, it'll make those conversations um, much less arbitrary because we all want to be able to manage conflict from a solution focused perspective. We don't just want to say, these are all the things that are shitty in my relationship. The, these are, we want to be able to say as mature adults, hopefully, um, you know, this is where I think we could better be better. And I'm, mm. this is what my idea of better is. You know, I get that, you know, we both have, we have a, a child now. This is going to be, um, this is going to be really hard for us. What, what's really good for me is when we have, um, two hours, you know, together on a Sunday where we go for our walks right, like we used to. And then we come home and we have sex. And, you know, I just really love that. That always makes me feel really close to you. A lot of the psychological research suggests that couples need about 90 minutes at the very least to have open, honest, communi you know, dialogue at the very least. That's can't be centered around things that they're doing together, you know, kids, dogs, bills, all that sort of stuff. We, we, we want to know, um, who the other person is and how they're going in life and how they're seeing the world and understanding what a happy relationship looks like for you is, is the most important thing because it gives you a, like, as you said before, a common goal. It doesn't make the relationship. Oh, well, that's us. We have a kid now. It's like, no, we're still fighting for something beyond ourselves. I, I, I totally get that. And, uh, you know, like for you to say, um, 
I, I know what everybody back home may or may not be thinking right now when you say, you know, a couple needs to ha have 90 minutes together uh, yeah. without distraction. Yes. For them to get towards some form of clarity and people will be like 90 minutes are you kidding 90 <laughs> seconds like it uh but but it, it goes to show what the importance of planning in a busy life may or may not you know may be you know uh sitting down and having a five minute tea at the end of the night or a glass of wine or whatever it might be that you guys um, choose to pursue together once the kids have gone to bed can be a really, really powerful step in the right direction and done enough times, it can place a really positive filter over your relationship. But I think what you're getting at, Tom, is um, if you can plan a date night where the kids have gone to bed and you've, got, you've you know, you, you've shelled out for a babysitter or the grandparents can come and sit at the TV while, uh, while the kids are uh, asleep, being able to really plan out that date night can give you guys the freedom to be able to be um, a little bit more yourselves, you know, w w without having this uh, identity of what is what you've stepped into as parents. And a lot of people say, oh, you know, I'm, I can't believe I'm that person that plans their entire life around, um, you know, my children. But the alternative to me is without planning, um, you know, you're kind of always scrapping, you know, you're always um, kind of improvising. And I feel like there's a certain element of uh, liberty that you can have within planning if you've delegated 90 minutes to be able to spend with each other every fortnight or whatever it might be. Um, th there's a certain freedom and creativity within that because you know it's there and you know that you get that kind of ability and, and freedom to be able to explore it together as well. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, to your point, I think we're unfortunately um, still picking up the pieces off the back end of what romanticism did to our culture. You know, this idea that we should live happily ever after and there is a soulmate out there. And, you know, life's hard. Life's really, really hard. It's, it, it's, nat it's evolutionarily hard. You know, we've, we've survived to the 21st century, survived. So we, we have this preset anxiety that just ripples through the way we live all the time. You know, that's not going anywhere. We are a species that survives. We aren't a species that lives happily ever after, you know? So we do need to plan because anxiety says, Hey, life is unpredictable. Planning mm. says there's a lot of predictability in life. The more you plan, the more freedom you actually have paradoxically. Um, so you're absolutely right. Yeah, I get it. I totally get it because I've experienced it and I've experienced both. I've experienced the frustrations of, you know, kind of sitting there like a spoiled little child going, we don't get to spend more time, enough time together. <laughs> but, but like without planning it out, you don't have that freedom to be able to, and that knowledge to be able to explore it. So I think, yeah. uh, and to bring that, to bridge that into, you know, taking care of yourself and the relationship within you and, and, and yourself, being able to take care of and nurture yourself through uh things like uh, you know introspective focus and uh journaling as well as taking care of your health through uh really? you know daily exercise and eating the uh, you know foods that are going to not, not just nourish your uh your body but your your mental clarity um i think men when once they become fathers they step into a, a paradigm that is self-sacrifice for the for the greater good of the family and i think a lot of people are getting hip to the fact that um that may be effective in the short term but it's very much not such a great idea in the long term because we fall apart if we don't take care of ourselves yeah and i think when we're talking about um self-sacrifice again it's an, it's another one of those things that uh sounds so lovely like oh we met and then it was happily ever after and you know kiss the frog and it turned into a prince or whatever it is but um self-sacrifice is um i don't know kind of dumb in my opinion because i think that life is an individual's game it's you, you are in this body you know it's your life and your life is a you know culmination of the decisions that you have made there must have been a reason why you decided to have a child with the partner that you did. So again, exploring yourself. Why is that? Well, you know, it's like, Oh, she's so incredible. It's like, yeah, well, 
you show up for her. So she's actually making you a better person. That's brilliant. Stay on to that. When you're talking about, um, you know, taking on a major challenge like a child, I've got, I mean, I can sort of get it. I've got two dogs. It's not, the, it's not the same thing, but I get the element of looking after something else. Um, you gave birth you, to two dogs. I gave birth to two dogs. Yeah. Not only have I um, changed my sex, I've actually given birth to different animals, mate. I've done well. <laughs> it's the 21st century. <laughs> no, but it's the idea that there's now more of a responsibility, I believe anyway, to look after myself even more. And that comes into planning. So it's, if I don't get my reading and my writing in every day, I don't feel myself. Um, I don't feel like I'm as present with my partner. I don't feel like I'm as present with my dogs when we take them out walking, etc. And I think uh, most men and um, women as well, I think this is a human thing, um, feel like this. You, I, you have to get to the best of your ability. And if it means waking up earlier, then I'm, I'm sorry, that, that's what it means. You know, um, you have to get the things in that fulfill you, that make you feel like you've earned your self-worth and that stuff that um, excretes the confidence. And for a lot of people that that is going to the gym, um, for me, it's reading and writing, um, you know, whatever it is. For some people, it's probably drinking a fucking cocktail at 9 a.m. in the morning, you know. Uh, probably wouldn't recommend that, but whatever is fulfilling that makes you feel like you've earned the day, then you can show up in the relationship. And I think that is like pivotal I think you're spot on when it comes to, uh, you know, trying to find what it is that kind of serves you and makes you more you to, so you can give more to the, the relationship and every relationship around you. Uh, and waking up earlier, I find in my mind is the easiest way. And I wake up pretty early to begin with, you know, so um, to be able to wake up, let's call it half an hour earlier to be able to get your exercise done for the day. You know, like when it comes to what is the uh, most effective time of the day to do exercise based on, you know, peaks in hormone uh, expression and blah, blah, blah. Who cares? You know, cares? The, the, the best time of the day to be able to do something meaningful that will nourish yourself is the time that you're going to actually do it whether it's yep. journal, whether it's exercise, whether it's self-reflection, whether it's spending some time with your partner, um, whether it's all of those things. And you know that that's the combination that's going to be able to give to you and make you a more complete person. Um, get up and do it. But what I found is um, the later in the day that you leave it, the more excuses you can, t can tend to build up. To, to give you reasons to avoid it. So that that's just in my personal experience of myself and also coaching dads. Yeah, and I think the sad irony, obviously you and I are both coaches, um, is that uh, the best time to exercise hormonally is towards uh, late afternoon or you know around the afternoon. So it's unfortunate when you're 5 a.m. pumping out burpees. But look, if that means that, you know, and if you, like you said, you wake up half an hour earlier, fantastic. Set the timer for 10 minutes, do as many burpees as you can in 10 minutes. You, you will never have worked that hard. That's a painful, painful workout. And you get a shower in, you get your teeth done, and then you can be there when your partner's waking up uh, or when your kids are getting ready for school. It's such a lovely feeling knowing that you have earned the day and you can give time um, to other people. It's a brilliant feeling. Yeah, it's a beautiful feeling. It's re it really is. Uh, Tell me, I, I know we're, we're winding up on the end of the chat. I know you're, uh, you're a busy man and you've got time uh, commitments. We all are, my friend. We all are. <laughs> just, don't we just? Not that you're going anywhere anytime soon. But, uh, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, uh, if there was one last uh, thought that you wanted to leave our dads with, what, what would you say that would be? I think it's really important um, to know how that's my dog actually he's probably telling me to wind up <laughs> i think it's really important in life to know uh what you want life is an outcome game we we, we lose ourselves existentially um and through change when we don't know who we are anymore and that's a very spiritual way in my perspective of just saying we don't know what uh, motivates us anymore we don't we've lost our goal you know and that can happen you think about um, first thing that comes to mind, you really want to be an AFL player, but then you um, have a child. I mean, it's going to be a lot harder for you to get to training, you know? So constantly um, spending time to go over your goals, 
um, your individual goals, your relationship goals. And if you don't have any goals, spend some time thinking about what kind of goals you would like to, it doesn't take us long. It's the, you know, that's the way we are forward moving animals. We're always in an unbearable state dreaming of a better world, you know, and you have to define that well for yourself because that's, what's going to give you a sense of purpose. You know, that every day I'm trying to move the needle closer to living that lifestyle um, mm. or being that person in this relationship or, or having a son or, or a daughter that, that, you know, says please and thank you, you know, whatever it is, you have to have a goal that means something to you. It will give your life purpose. It'll pull you through the shitty times and um, it will, it will, it will really save you from, I think a lot of the, the chaos that comes with living in an abundant world. I love that, mate. And it's uh, such a powerful uh, series of words to, to finish off because you can, you can break your, your life up into various different departments and it doesn't need to be one overarching goal. It can be, you know, compartmentalized when it comes to uh, your daily life. And uh, yeah, something to think about. They've been uh, incredibly wise words. Thank you, Tommy. Not at all, mate. I always love it. They're always great chats. <laughs> Right. This is just us simply pressing record. We do this all the time. Exactly. Exactly. In fact, you're just in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy boy, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Mate, always a pleasure.